The luxury cruise liner Royal Caribbean Rhapsody of the Seas sailed into the Caribbean Sea early Saturday morning on March 21, 1998. On board were 2,000 idle passengers. They had an unforgettable journey to one of the most beautiful islands of the Caribbean, Curaçao, located 80 kilometers from Venezuela. The liner was a whole entertainment complex. There were bars, nightclubs, and movie theater, two swimming pools with seawater, steakhouse, pizzeria, own bakery, SBA salon, fitness hall, restaurants with Mexican, Italian, and Asian cuisine. On the deck, a 23-year-old girl in sunglasses, shorts, and a bright t-shirt squinted blissfully from the bright spring sun. She is holding a refreshing lemonade. The radio is softly broadcasting Celine Dion's hit song, My Heart Will Go On from the sensational Titanic. A light sea breeze is blowing. That's happiness. A girl chats with her tanned bare feet admiring the sunny panorama. Her name is Amy Lynn Bradley and she has just graduated from the University of Virginia. Amy planned to start working for a computer consulting company soon. And in the meantime, she planned to take a nice vacation with her parents and her younger brother, Brad, who was 21 years old. Ron and Eva Bradley, middle-class Americans, decided to treat their children to a week-long cruise. The brother and sister immediately attracted attention by partying, partying, and dancing till they dropped. Dark-haired with a short haircut, amazingly plastic, sociable Amy danced fiercely and soon became a local star. She quickly made new friends and participated in all the entertainment events. Mr. Bradley disliked the attention of the men, both vacationers and liner staff, to his pretty, perky daughter. Ron made several remarks to Amy, but she brushed them off. Dad, I'm fine. I'm not doing anything wrong. I know how to stand up for myself. Ron had no doubt about the latter. She was an excellent athlete with equal success in basketball and swing. Amy Lynn had been separated from her parents for a year and considered herself an independent and sensible girl. She planned her budget, studied, played sports, worked as a lifeguard at the beach, had a bulldog named Daisy, and rented an apartment. Of course, some things Ron and Willow didn't encourage. Daughter as a sign of special love for basketball made under the shoulder blade tattoo. The Tasmanian devil spins a basketball on one finger. Well, that modern youth. Kids don't think about what it will look like in 20 years. And now Ron was trying to keep the intrusive thoughts out of his mind. What could possibly go wrong with Amy traveling with her parents and almost always in her brother's company aboard a comfortable cruise ship? On that ill-fated evening, March 23, 1998, the liner docked in Curaçao, which was marked by a lavish dinner on the top deck of the ship. The guests dressed accordingly to the dress code, men in suits, Ladies in evening gowns enjoyed fine food and drink. For the dinner, Amy chose a long black stripless dress that effectively emphasized her figure. Dedicated waiters in white gloves, expensive dishes, chandeliers playing with diamond glow, dishes from the chef, everything was solemn and festive. Mr. Bradley and his wife, tired from the sea voyage and the lavish dinner, preferred to go to bed early, and Amy and Brad went to a party at the ship's nightclub, Mardi Gras, to listen to live music and have fun until dawn. The brother and sister sipped cocktails and when the disco started, went to the center of the dance floor. Musician Alastair Douglas from the ship's band Blue Orchid began to give Amy signs of attention, treated her to drinks, and invited her to dance. The girl behaved relaxed and flirted with him with pleasure. A local photographer captured Amy dancing with Alastair. The couple paid tribute to hot drinks. According to Douglas, he left the party at about 1 a.m. and Amy stayed with her brother to party further. Brad gave up first and left the party. Around 3.35, he showed up at his cabin, which was detected by the computerized door locking system. Amy smoked a cigarette, admired the night sky, and came to the cabin five minutes later. Before going to bed, her brother and sister went out on the cabin balcony and talked for a while. Amy, hot from the dancing, went to sleep on the balcony in the chaise lounge. The cabin was stuffy. Ron woke up at about half past six to find Amy sleeping peacefully in a chaise lounge on the balcony of the cabin. Mr. Bradley had fallen into a shallow sleep, but somehow he couldn't sleep. He opened his eyes at six in the morning. His daughter had mysteriously disappeared from the balcony as if vanishing into thin air. Ron immediately woke his wife and son. The parents thought the girl had gone for an early breakfast, but her shoes were still there. She couldn't have left barefoot with only her cigarettes and lighter could she. The family panicked and set off in search of Amy. Ron appealed to the ship's crew to help find Amy and announced on a loudspeaker that she was missing. 
but the management objected. Mr. Bradley, it's early morning and we can't wake the passengers and make a fuss. We'll wait until eight o'clock and make an announcement. Amy's worried relatives searched for her all over the ship and sent her pager messages, but the girl did not respond. The family begged the crew to move the ship away from the dock and remove the gangways. If Amy is kidnapped and is with a kidnapper, the criminal will not be able to leave the liner. Security ignored the family's pleas. Many of the passengers disembarked unhindered and went on a tour of the island of Curacao. The chances of finding Amy were fading by the minute due to the inaction of the liner's crew. Finally, the ship's captain ordered a search of the ship around 1 o'clock p.m. The staff combed 10 decks and cabins, but in vain. Ron begged for pictures of Amy to be posted and notices to be put out that she was missing. The captain denied his request. It would instill nervousness and disturb the passengers enjoying their vacation. No one but her parents and brother took Amy's disappearance seriously. The Bradley family disembarked the liner on the island of Curacao and contacted the U.S. Embassy which in turn enlisted the FBI to track down the girl. A full-scale search unfolded. According to one of the versions, Amy could fall into the water, leaning over the railing of the balcony, and drowned. But firstly, the rungs were too high, and secondly, Amy was an excellent swimmer. Could she have intentionally jumped? Her parents and brother clearly denied it. Amy was a sensible, balanced girl with plans for the future. The FBI interviewed eyewitnesses who saw Amy that ill-fated night, under suspicion was the bassist of the musical group Alastair Douglas, with whom Amy drank and had fun. A passenger named Crystal Roberts confirmed that the couple were slow dancing and whispering. Mr. Douglas confirmed his flirtation with Amy, but assured that he left the party much earlier than she did. The cameraman, who was hired by the company to create publicity for the cruise, provided a video from the nightclub. It shows Amy and Alastair dancing. Two girls claimed to have seen Amy and Alistair leaving the elevator around 5.30 walking towards the ship's club. Alistair later passed a polygraph Friends, test. Friends, thank you for watching. Support However, the channel by subscribing, liking, or commenting. On the and morning see you of March in new exciting when videos. Amy went missing, Alistair approached Brad to express his regrets about the girl's disappearance. Afterward, Brad realized that Alistair could not have been informed of the disappearance because only the family and crew members knew about it at the time. Other interviewed passengers of the airliner who remembered Amy gave interesting and unexpected testimonies. Some of them noticed that the waiters were inappropriately familiar with Amy Bradley, calling her by name, flirting shamelessly, passing notes, and making plans. Hey, baby. Sumuli moored off the coast of the island of Aruba. Why don't you come with me to Carlos and Charlie's for a drink? By the way, this is the bar where the infamous young American Natalie Holloway will disappear in 2005. Meanwhile, the FBI discovered that the liner's crew had not conducted a thorough search of the ship. They only took a cursory look at the restrooms and public areas without looking the cabins of staff and passengers. Amy's family was furious. Eva Bradley, Amy's mother, recalled one odd circumstance during dinner the night before her daughter disappeared. The ship's photographer had taken pictures of all the restaurant guests. The photos were later displayed on a stand at the entrance to the restaurant so that passengers could buy their favorite shots. Remarkably, Amy was photographed a lot that evening and night, but all the photos of her somehow disappeared. The further the FBI delved into the case, the more frightening details came to light. It turns out that on the night of Amy's disappearance, on board the liner from the island of Curaco, came up a dance show group to participate in the disco. Along with them, strangers, who were neither dancers nor passengers of the ship, entered the liner and wanted to have fun at the disco. Days passed, but there was no news of Amy, even though any information about the girl was rewarded. The parents promised a quarter of a million dollars to anyone who had data on her whereabouts and could help Amy's smooth return. In August 1998, five months after Amy's disappearance, David Carmichael, an engineer from Canada, was vacationing on the island of Curaco. On the beach, he saw a girl who looked very much like the missing Amy, accompanied by two men. The girl looked intimidated and took a step towards David, but one of the men roughly pulled her away and shouted threateningly at her. Carmichael noticed an unusual tattoo on the stranger's shoulder. Agents immediately went in search of the girl, but she had vanished into thin air. Desperate parents hired a private detective, former military Frank Jones, who was sure that Amy fell into the hands of the Colombian Mafia. He sent the girl's family photo reports and fake descriptions of her search, extorting money from the unhappy parents. 
Assuring Ron and Evie that Amy could be saved as a result of special operations, Jones asked to send him over the stated amount of another $100,000 on top. The inconsolable parents were told to go to Florida and wait for their daughter. Unfortunately, Jones turned out to be a con artist who had been leading the Bradley family around by the nose. Pseudo detectives squandered their money in bars and entertainment centers, for which he paid prison time. Since the disappearance of the girl has passed a quarter of a century, but the case has not moved from the dead point. According to one of the anonymous witnesses, the girl, similar to Amy Lynn Bradley, he met in a brothel on the island of Curacao in 1999. She may have been sold into slavery. The girl looked distraught and depressed. The man mailed a photo of the sex worker to Amy's parents only in 2005. The police rushed to score brothels and hot spots, but found no trace of the girl. Then eyewitnesses allegedly met Amy then in Barbados, then in a cafe on the island of Curacao. She was always seen accompanied by men. Amy's mother in her interview with People magazine complained that her daughter has always attracted admiring and very aggressive attention of men and may have become someone's trophy. The most plausible version was that Amy was killed on a ship and thrown overboard. Amy Lynn Bradley was officially pronounced dead on March 24, 2010, 12 years after her disappearance and with no body found. If the Bradley family had known how their trip on the luxury cruise ship would end, they never would have stepped aboard.